Paul, Greg, great to be talking to you. Paul Templer, your CEO of Viper. Greg Massey, you're based in the US and you are US advisor for Viper. So Paul, let's get straight to it. You were founded back in 2009. You were one of the early employees, I believe, at Viper. But for those who don't know the company, what are the problems you're solving for the industry? Our focus is really in, in two areas. The first is to do with the data that's being generated from the post bind activities of these delegated arrangements. So typically we see that as Bordro uh, that are being sent in from uh, an agent to an insurer or a broker. And what we essentially do is give our customers the tools and in some cases people um, to help aggregate all the data that they're receiving into a single conformed data model within a data warehouse. Um, that data is fully scrubbed, cleansed and validated along the way. And then we, we sit some uh, really advanced analytical capability, uh, a sophisticated model and also some pre-built reports, really with the aim to help our customers improve operational efficiency <clears throat> and also underwriting performance. And then the second part is to do with um, helping our customers to onboard uh, the third parties that they're going to be working with. It's been really interesting to see how you've evolved over the years. You got some funding from PE firm Tenzing back in 2020. You've talked a bit about how you've evolved, but how else is that investment helping you grow the business? Yeah, that, that investment's been really, really helpful and essential, really, in, in helping us grow to the next level of our, our sort of uh, evolution. Um, I guess the three key areas that it's helped us with is in investing in people. So we already had a really good team and we've been able to bring some new exceptional individuals into that team to help us grow uh, as a business in terms of skill set and also knowledge. Uh, we've been able to invest in our products. So we've always been very forward thinking in, in how we develop the products, but it's really allowed us to take that a step further and also bring new products uh, to market that we didn't have previously. And then finally, um, it's really helped us to grow into new markets. So you'll, you'll see that Greg is based out in the US and the US and North America is, is definitely a market that we are starting to have some, some good results in. So uh, new market growth is, is another key area for us. And you mentioned there that people is a big part of this. And it's been really encouraging to see the people that have joined Viper in the last few years. You've, you've got some very professional team working with you, looking after marketing and sales and some of the product development. Greg, I just want to turn to you now. You were formerly head of programs for Zurich in the US. You've got a long history of working for US carriers. What was it about Viper that led you to decide, make a slight switch to come across and work with a technology organization after a career working directly for insurance carriers? What drew me to Viper was um, working on the carrier side for almost 40 years and then officially retiring in May and I thought he'd be staying retired. Uh, this opportunity came up because one of the things in, in the U.S. marketplace is uh, at the program level, MGA level, is really uh, developing that transparency of data between the carrier and the delegated authority. Um, that's the, the MGA or the, um, or the program administrator. It's always going to be complex, but what Viper does is remove the complication around data exchanges and uses thereof. Yeah, Greg, I really like the way you, you talk about the role of Viper is to remove complexity. You know, we've been thinking and talking about innovation in underwriting. We're about to reframe that as making underwriters' lives easier. And you know, I think these days we've realized that innovation is a lot about simplifying processes. That's not always easy to do that. I want to talk to you a bit about the challenges you're seeing in the U.S. You know, Viper started off in the U.K. What are some of the specific challenges that U.S. carriers and MGAs and their partners have got when it comes to ob obtaining and, and sharing data between different organizations that are working together? Well, you know, I, I see the biggest two challenges um, that we won't talk about here is talent management and also CAT and accumulation management. But outside of that, there's, there's multiple views of how a portfolio is performing. Uh, there's the carrier view, and then the MGA or program administrator. And the optimal uh, view is what you want to get to is one view. And, and that's what Viper brings here is everyone's looking at real-time data, the same data, and can, then can look at uh, how is this 
portfolio performing. The biggest challenge many of our MGAs have here in the States is every two or three years, the carrier may change their appetite uh, on a particular portfolio and want to get off of it. Now the distributor has to go out and remarket that portfolio when if the transparency was upfront, um, proactive actions could be taken to make sure that portfolio is, is profitable and remains with an appetite. Greg, I, I really like that single view, one consistent view across different parties. I think people who didn't know insurance might be surprised to, to understand that there were different views of the same data and, and the fact that you're bringing it together and, and actually overcoming that challenge. You know, I can see why you've been successfully expanding into the, into the US pool. And just on that point, Paul, it'd be, it'd be really interesting to know from a practical point of view, how, how do your clients access this information? But if someone was to visualize what Viper looked like, how would you describe that to them? Yeah, it's really interesting. We've always had a concept to keep things as simple as possible. And to that end, all of our tooling is accessed via a web browser. So, so super simple mechanism to, to access that everyone has at their, their desktop. And essentially what we give, not only the tooling to help gather this data that's gonna help them have that single view of their portfolio, but also the, the tooling to allow them to very easily analyze the data. And that's through pre-canned reports, but also the ability to build out additional reports that, that may suit specific needs. So I think the transparency is something that we're really, really keen on. The, the data we're processing is our customer's data, and we want to make sure they have full access to it. And Paul, what about user numbers? Is that a useful way to understand you know, the scope and scale of what Viper is doing? Yeah, user numbers is a, is a really interesting subject. So we've got approaching 50 customers uh, globally. Um, but one of the key, key sort of um, pillars of, of what we offer is operational efficiency to our customers. So we're actually trying to help them do more with less people. Um, you know, typically our customers uh, will range from small customers that maybe have a couple of users up to very large customers that may have tens of users. But ultimately, the sort of the start position may well have been they, they would have had many more users and have been able to reduce that headcount and redeploy to other areas uh, through the use of our product. I think you just found our tagline, do more with less people. That sounds like a great way of uh, positioning, your, <laughs> positioning your product. Well, people have got quite a lot of choices these days when it comes to working with companies out there. What is it that people are thinking about when they're making decisions about using the kind of technology that, you, that you're offering? Yeah, that, that's a great question. There's lots of considerations that businesses are going through when they're looking to, to work with, with a software vendor. Um, I mean, they range from things like uh, the length of time that you've been providing that particular service or, or product, uh, the capabilities of that product. Uh, and I, I guess referenceability as well is, is a big thing. Um, we certainly are really keen to continue to invest in our products uh, and make sure that we are driving the capabilities and features of the products forwards. And a lot of that is driven by our customer base. And we have a very uh, active customer base that gets involved in user groups and uh, special interest groups and the like that really help us uh, define the roadmap on how we are going to drive those products forwards. And Paul, I think one of the things uh, how people make choices is um, there's something to be said for showing uh, what it can do. So your, the proof of concepts, you know, they, they understand the outcome of that is um, not only insights for impact, but also how easy it is to do business with you, uh, the, the catalog of products that you offer, and, and a lot, nothing's neither good nor bad except by comparison. So being able to compare what you offer compared to what they're currently using. And sometimes they don't have, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very unsophisticated what they're using. Um, whether it's themselves doing it um, or they went out and bought something and that helps them, you know, come around to what Viper really has and, and what, what they're offering versus um, just, just talking about what it can do. You're showing them. Uh, and Greg, it's good to see the progress Viper has been making out in the U.S. I'm sure you're responsible for, for a lot of that. But, but what are you hearing about companies in the U.S. buying you know, from a company that originated in the, in the U.K. and is still largely based in the U.K.? Well, you know, buying from a company in the UK, um, it, it helps from testimonials from uh, carriers over there. And there's a number of carriers over there and MGAs that do business here. So 
association um, uh, by that approach certainly helps. Carriers that have been uh, that they're uh, that are current cu customers today, that certainly helps in the testimonials and references. Uh, and I think my involvement with people that I've been dealing with for a long time, and and you know Viper was new to the scene uh, maybe two years ago. They're really not new to the scene today. Uh, they're quite visible in many of the trade shows, and and also with some of the bigger players. Yeah, it's still very much a people business, isn't it? Insurance, even though you know it plays as big as the U.S., you have a lot of conferences out there. People want to know what other people are using, and uh, yeah, a great testament to what you've been doing that, that people are making choices to to work with you. And Paul, we've been talking about clients, but it'd be great if you can name some of the examples that people would be familiar with of whom you're working with. Yeah, but by all means. So um, certainly here in the UK, uh, we're currently working with around 40% of the Lloyd's managing agents. So that would include people like uh, Canopius, uh, Hamilton, Everest Re, uh, so some of the sort of the larger names uh, in in the industry, uh, and it's quite interesting that with uh, some of the changes that are being made to the uh, DDM mandate, there's certainly a lot more interest in in that that managing agent space at the moment. Um, but we also work with some of the medium and large brokers uh, here in the UK as well, so people like Acrisure and Tizers, for example. Uh, as customers. Um, in the US, uh, we have tier one carriers uh, as customers, um, right the way down to smaller operations, maybe startup fronting carriers, and also some reinsurers like uh, RE um, as customers. So again, c c quite a, a variety of customers there. And then uh, in Europe, we're working with insurers. And also I mentioned earlier that we have uh, a large Swiss Swiss reinsurer that we're working with. Unfortunately, we can't name at the moment, but uh, yeah, that, that that's really exciting. Paul, well, I'd love to hear some examples about use cases or success stories from your clients that have been using your tools to reveal what's going on with their data. I think the data really is the, the key to all of this. I think historically, lots of data has been gathered and stored from things like boardroom management, but never really looked at or analyzed properly. Um, we're certainly seeing that our customers now are, are making a great deal of, of benefit from the, the data and indeed the analytical capability that we have. So things like EPI monitoring, so um, they're able to see that the plan that they set aside to um, monitor what, what they thought they'd be writing uh, from a premium perspective compared to what they are actually writing uh, has become really valuable because it allows them to see at a very early stage if things are going off track, they can redeploy um, that capital to other uh, facilities if necessary. And also things like uh, reserves and um, capital adequacy is really impacted by uh, the business plans that are being set out. And if they're not um, being adhered to, then clearly there's money set aside that, that's just going to waste that could be used for, for other things. So that, that's certainly a, a big area for us. But on top of that, things like claims analysis, um, general operational improvements, how well is the data um, being uh, processed? Uh, how long is it taking? Are there any outliers of the particular data supplies that are trickier to work with than others? And things like that are really informing conversations when it comes to renewals of certain facilities. And they're taking that into consideration when they're, they're looking to offer new terms. Now, we've had a couple of acronyms in there. Let you get away with the first one, DDM, but you then mentioned EPI. Can you just remind us what both of those stand for? <laughs> yes, of course. So, so uh, EPI, um, estimated premium income. Um, so essentially uh, how the premium is, is, is coming in. Is it coming in uh, linear in a linear fashion, so a straight line, or is the seasonality to the way that that premium is going to come in? Um, so to know what you're expecting and then to be able to monitor um, what is going on in, in real in real terms is, is very, very valuable. And DDM, Delegated Data Manager, which is uh, the Lloyd's um, system that is used for, for Bordreau. Thank you. Greg, just we'll turn to you now, just if you can recall with your hat previously working on the other side of the, uh, the desk uh, in an insurance company, how, how do you help companies justify the buying decision? You know, again, you know, budgets are under close scrutiny. People have got to believe they can generate more value or save money when they're spending money on, on technology. What are the kind of things that can help people understand that and you know, convince their uh, financial department to release the funds for getting hold of a tool that Viper produces? Well, and, and you know, helping companies uh, come about to make the financial investment 
here and partner with Viper. You know, a number of companies want to build versus buy. And uh, certainly we sit down with them, help them understand, you know, these are folks like what I was doing, running a P&L. And at the end of the day, I need things sooner and faster uh, rather than uh, allowing an IT department internal and, and, um, and all the bureaucracy to get there to take, uh, you know, years to get there. Uh, we don't have years when we're running a, a P&L. So sitting there helping them understand, let's take Bordero, uh, for example, um, and the proof of concept and case studies uh, with hands-on, with, with Paul's team, uh, with, our, with our potential customers, showing them how quick this can be done, how the data can be sanitized, and the use case there, um, and, 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 and really trimming back the amount of time getting to an answer. Uh, and again, when you look at the insights, uh, it, you know, what Paul's team does is help show with a collection of data, the, the typical proof of concept, you know, here's some insights for impact. If you had this information today, um, let us work with you in helping understand what the impact is on your bottom line. It, sometimes it just shaves off, uh, you know, fractions of a percent. But um, a number of insights with a collection of fractions of percents makes a big, big deal uh, at the end of the day. And, and it allows you to price your product uh, in a favorable fashion to create longevity and holding on to that portfolio. Um, it's a very competitive business out there, and every fraction of a percent matters. And that's what Viper helps bring to the table in, in the proof point in helping people see, yes, we need this, we need to do it sooner than later, versus waiting for two years or the next operational financial cycle. There's two points there you made that I want to bring out, both of which other people have mentioned and are really key, but people don't often think about it that way. That point about fractions of percent, if you're working on a portfolio of, you know, in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars of premium, fraction of percent actually adds up to a large amount of money. That's the first one. And then your point earlier on about the decision of build versus buy, I was talking to somebody else recently, and you know, they pointed out that their biggest competitors were actually their clients' own IT department. And you know, it seems to me you're in a similar situation where actually these organizations are much better off and going and working as a third party like yourself and, and, and trying to stand in line, wait, wait until the IT department can free up some resource to go and do it. So, uh, yeah, really, really good to hear those, those two coming out. So, Paul, Viper was founded in 2009. The world of technology development has gone through a massive change in that time. But you know, more recently, what, what are you proud of that you've been able to do in the last couple of years? Yeah, the, the last couple of years have, have really seen an acceleration in, in what we've been able to do in terms of the product lineup. So um, in that time, we've been able to bring three new products to market. Um, so that's our API enabled portal, which allows uh, data to be sent in by uh, an agent or third party that's supplying information to an insurer or broker. Um, we have our insurance data cloud, which is our cloud data warehouse. Um, which is fantastic for not only um, analytical capability, but also for data sharing and other downstream processes. So if we want to feed data into reinsurance um, systems or uh, analytical uh, ledgers, for example, um, th that, that can be done through the data cloud. And then we've talked about it already, but the insights side of things uh, is a, I'm really, really proud of what the team's done there. They've spent couple of years building out an awesome data model and some really good analytical capability, um, which is, is really uh, proving valuable to our customers. So that's sort of new products. And on top of that, we've been introducing new features to our existing products to really make sure that they are best in class. Well, I'm sure your friends at Tenzing will be delighted that how you've been responsibly spending the money and, and not investing it in a yacht or something that could be <laughs> happened in the, in the past. Uh, but looking forward then, what about industry trends that are happening? What are, you, what are you keeping your eye on as you look at the next two years? Yeah, I mean, for me, there's certainly some, some really interesting um, insure techs that are, that are coming out at the moment with, with some fantastic new, new technology. Uh, we're seeing the use of uh, AI, machine learning, uh, chat GPT, for example, coming into play 
uh, in, a, in a big way in the market. And I think if we can find some really good use cases um, for, for that technology, I think it's really going to move things forwards, not only in the product, but also in the development of products, things like the, the generation of code and, and that sort of thing is, is really fascinating. Um, I think there's a, a continued focus on um, the data and the analysis of that data. And I think that can really benefit the industry. I think the more we know about the data that we're processing, the better. And I think the more that we can move towards a integrated model where um, InsureTechs are, are keen to work together, we've started to build a, a really good partner ecosystem up with people like Advantage Go, Insurity, Guidewire, where we're actually looking to plug the, the systems into each other and make that journey for the customers much more easy. So I think you know, our part, partner ecosystem piece is going to be to prove re really valuable. Yeah, that is so much where things are going. And you've got your API, so you don't have to sort of bash a square peg into a round hole. <laughs> you know, the connectivity should be a lot easier. Indeed. Greg, what about you? I mean, you've, you've had a few years in the industry. You're out in the US. Any, any different shifts in how your former colleagues or insurers and carriers are looking at the trends in the industry they care about? Well, I think, I think uh, well, let's just talk the data here. I think the speed to market uh, for impact sooner than later. Um, uh, people don't have the patience um, for things to get better. Uh, they, they're very impatient. And um, we talked about the build versus buy before. There's also internal execution risk that carriers are faced with. So certainly what Viper's team brings to the table, it's, it's, it's already there. It's just a matter of blending the two cultures and, and applying it to a given portfolio. So I think that's where um, the, the level of impatience for results is, um, is, is just imperative out there. And, and that's what I'm seeing, um, whether it's at the MGA side or the carrier side. And, and Viper helps bring that solution to the table. No, I love that concept of impatience. I mean, sometimes people think insurers are a bit sleepy, but, but they, you're absolutely right. And these days people need to make decisions sooner. We did an event talking to risk managers recently, and what was really interesting, and I think encouraging at some level for all of us, is these risk managers who for years have been asked for information from insurers and now being asked to provide more data are asking, well, what are you going to do with our data? Because we're now providing it to you, but why and what do we, what do, we do with it? So, I think we're seeing pressure from you know, the, you, your clients' clients at the end of the day to do something with that data as well, and of course the brokers in between. So there's, you know, it's a very virtual circle this now. Everybody wants to see more. I think ultimately everybody wins. If you get better data, you get, you get better insights. Uh, and then finally, Paul, I believe you have some news about a new product you're going to be launching fairly soon. Can we uh, get some breaking news about what you're doing with your real-time data exchange? Yes, of course. Um, so, you know, a lot of what we've talked about today uh, has been about data that's being supplied via Bordro. And, you know, quite often that data is 60 or 90 days old by the time it gets analysed. And of course, that, that that's a, a long time in insurance to make decisions. So we're actually um, working with partners to um, enable real time, time data exchange. So uh, information coming, you know, within hours uh, rather than months. Um, straight through to our, uh, our systems in real time, um, giving our insurance customers the abilities to make underwriting decisions immediately rather than with a, a 90 day lag. So it's a, it's a huge uh, step for us and something that we've always done, which is to try and supply the technology that suits all use cases. So we're absolutely looking to support that broader use case. That's going to remain sort of the major use case for some time, but actually give the tools and capabilities to move towards that real-time data exchange and, and make that real. Well, Greg, your, your impatient friends over in the US should be delighted to, to, with the real-time data exchange now that things are going to happen more quickly. Paul, Greg, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. I learned an awful lot, which is always a good indication of how much we covered. Looking forward to seeing you both face to face before too long, Greg, either in the US or over here in the UK. But thank you very much to both thank of you. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, thank you.